There is nothing I love more than an amazing meal with high quality meat cooked at home because let's be honest, eating out is so expensive. And you also know that eating out is the number one budget buster. That is why I am so glad I found ButcherBox. ButcherBox is a premium meat subscription service dedicated to delivering high quality, grass fed, and grass finished beef, organic chicken, pork raised crate free, and wild caught seafood directly to your doorstep with free shipping always. You even get exclusive member deals, recipes, and a variety of high-quality cuts at an amazing price. New users will receive their choice of two pounds of ground beef, three pounds of chicken thighs, or one pound of premium steak tips for a year. Use code ETM and get $20 off your first box at butcherbox.com. Last night, we made a beef stew with meat from ButcherBox, and you can taste the difference. It was so satisfying and delicious. And all of our friends that were over for a dinner party, they raved at how good it was. So do yourself a favor and eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering my listeners their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips, for free in every order for a year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash etm and use code etm to choose your free offer and get $20 off. When it comes to financial advice, you got to trust the source. It's why you listen to this podcast. When I'm looking to upgrade my wallet, I turn to NerdWallet. Their expert team of nerds dives into the details to help you find smarter financial products. Before NerdWallet, I was paying for vacations all wrong. (laughs) I was missing out on miles. I didn't even know I was leaving on the table. Now I've got a new card with more miles and more upgrades. What could future you do with more travel rewards? I don't know, maybe that fancy hotel upgrade that you have always been dreaming about. Wherever you go next, make it happen with a smarter travel credit card. Don't wait to make smart financial decisions. Compare and find smarter credit cards, savings accounts, and more today at nerdwallet.com. NerdWallet. Finance smarter. As with all cards, credit is subject to lender approval and terms apply. Money is very emotional beyond beyond what it should be. Like clearly we need money to live and clearly having more money can be useful. And so it's reasonable to be emotionally invested in it at a kind of macro level. But I feel like our emotional investment at a dollar to dollar level is often disproportionate, certainly in my case. And, and just being aware of that is helpful. Welcome to Everyone's Talking Money podcast. I'm your host, Shauna Game. There's no judgment, no dumb questions, just smart conversations about you and your money. So come on in and grab a seat. Everyone is welcome here. Algorithms can do so much more than control social media feeds. In fact, they have the power to save lives and improve our health. At the Weizmann Institute, Professor Yonina Eldar has pioneered innovative algorithms that optimize MRI scans and make ultrasound devices more portable, affordable, and accessible. Professor Eldar's lab develops AI tools that can pave the way to new technologies that can see, hear, and communicate beyond existing limits. Learn more at CelebratingGreatMinds.org. Have you ever sat back and wondered, what is the actual story of how and why money was created? Well, if you haven't, I certainly have. You know, in this pod, every episode, we're talking about different ways to create a better relationship with your money and breaking down all the how-tos and how-not-tos with your money. But let's just take a little step back from that, if you'll indulge me, and let's look at why we even use money in the first place. I think you can probably certainly agree with me that money has messed us up. It's divided us. It causes so much stress and fear. But on the other hand, money also has the power to create change and a lot of other good stuff. It's a very complicated story that our guest, Jacob Goldstein, author of the book Money, The True Story of a Made-Up Thing, former co-host of NPR's Planet Money podcast, and host of a new podcast called What's Your Problem, took a deep dive into. Jacob's new book, It's a Must-Read Riveting Story of Money, with all the salacious twists and turns. 
I'm going to let Jacob tell you more, like the story of how Marco Polo uncovered that people were using paper money and how it changed everything and so many other juicy details that we chat about. Let's start talking. I have been searching a long time now. I think when I I hit you up on Twitter, I think I've been trying to find someone who was up for talking about the history of money. And you spent decades in the world of money as co-host of NPR's Planet Money. You wrote the book called Money, of apparently so, the true story of a made-up thing. And I love this line. You wrote, money only works because we all agree to believe in it. That's so powerful. I I want to dive into that. But before we get into the nitty gritty of the history of money, tell us, you know, with all the different forms of digital currency, we've got Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and NFTs. And we even have some countries like like Sweden that are even moving away from paper money. You know, why is now the perfect time to tell this story of money? I mean, honestly, I think it's always a good time to tell the story of money. <laughs> it's true. There's a lot happening right now. But, you know, money is this really deep thing. And, you know, I think we tend to think of money as something kind of cold, mathematical, almost like a, you know, physical thing. But in fact, the thing that I love about money, about the story of money, is is it's really this very social kind of warm, fuzzy thing that, that people create and reinvent in this very uh, social way. And, and that's what I find most interesting. It's a way of thinking about, you know, the way people work in society in a really deep, interesting way. Right. There's a lot of layers to the onion, right? Yeah. <laughs> when, we, when we talk about money. And so I, I'm curious, how, what, I guess, what was the process like, like compiling all this information to, to write this book? I mean, how long did it take you to really dig deep and investigate this story of money? Well, you know, I came to sort of the study of money and actually money itself pretty late in my life to the extent that I've come to money at all. Um, you know, I studied English in college and uh, was a reporter covering healthcare. And um, and when the financial crisis hit in two thousand eight, that was when I was like, "Huh, something? What? What? What's going on here? What's the deal with what's going money? On? Something? Yeah. Something's happening? Yeah." And so I uh, I went out to dinner with my aunt, who was she was like the the businesswoman in the family. She uh, was a successful businesswoman in New York, and you know knew money, understood money in a way that I didn't. And so, you know, it's maybe September, October 2008, when the price of not just stocks like now, but, you know, houses, and you really feel like the economy is coming down at that moment. And and I was curious, like, why the price of everything seemed to have fallen so much. And I, I asked her this question, like, where did all that money go, right? There's like trillions of dollars has disappeared from the stock market and from home prices. <laughs> Where did it go? And she said, uh, she said, you know, it was never really there in the first place. She said, money isn't really real. She said, money is fiction. And that to me as a, you know, former English major was a really exciting moment. I was like, oh, I know about fiction, right? I didn't think money was like that. And so that was whatever, 2008. Not long after that, I went to uh, to this podcast, Planet Money, at NPR. And then I spent about 10 years covering economics. And and I got really interested in this larger history of money and realized, I realized there was a whole book there. I mean, obviously, with the history of money, there's more than one book there. But realized <laughs> there was a lot that you couldn't fit in a podcast. So I spent, you know, I don't know, a year uh, just working on the book and then more time, you know, doing reporting at Planet Money and kind of fixing the book. Well, I want to get back to this sh- social aspect that you bring up. I I think I dog-eared about every page in the book. Ah, and so bless your heart. Coming back and thinking <laughs> about like what we were going to talk about, I was like, wow, okay, I have like, I have like 100 things that I dog-eared and circled. So let's just start somewhere. But you wrote that money isn't some accounting device that makes up the exchange and saving more convenient. It's a deep part of our social fabric bound up with blood and lust. That really got me. And then you wrote, no wonder we get so worked up over it. And I feel like we are often so detached from our feelings around money, and yet money gives us all some really serious, serious feels. So, you know, I'm curious about, because especially because you brought up this social aspect, you know, why, 
how we become so attached to the meaning of money or to the feelings of money when it really is just this made up thing. Well, it's made up in a really deep way, right? The fact that it's made up, I mean, I use that word in the subtitle of the book because it seemed fun, but made up does not mean trivial or silly, right? It's money is is made up and it is profound. Um, I mean, what that, that sentence that you uh, uh, read is about the origins of money, you know, and the People used to think, basically, that the origin of money was just sort of this tool so that people didn't have to barter, right? Kind of a just-so story. But right. but what anthropologists found when they went around the world in the 20th century looking at, at societies that, you know, in different – that did material exchange in different ways, basically. When they looked in particular at, you know, smaller non-industrial societies where, you know, most things were based on kinship uh, and they didn't have – money like we have money, what they found was very often there were a lot of uh, rules around um, lending things, around gift giving, around obligation. And two of the classic places where there were rules uh, were marriage and murder, right? And so marriage, I mean, we're kind of familiar with the idea of, you know, a dowry, a bride price, right? And so in many places, uh, there are certain things that are that one gives to the family of, you know, the, the marriage partner, right? So cattle, say, is a classic, right? If And it varies kind of by gender, and the rules are different in different places. But say, if, you know, if your daughter is going to marry uh, the boy of another family, you might give cattle to the other family, traditionally. And similarly, with murder, it turns out, less familiar to us, uh, there, there are in many places rules, like if somebody from your family kills somebody from somebody else's family, you got to give them some kind of thing. And typically, or often, that thing is specified. And so those instances where, you know, okay, murder is an outlier, but lots of people get married. In traditional societies, pretty much everybody gets married. Most people get married. And uh, so if let's you... Let's hope most people don't murder. Let's, let's hope. hope let's hope. It, I mean, it was more common <laughs> in the hope, old days. Let's hope, right? But yeah. Um, so if you know, you know, you have kids, your kids are probably going to get married. You know you're going to have to give, say, cattle to uh, to somebody's family when your kid gets married, then that cattle suddenly, those cows, are not just cows to you, right? They have this value that is a little bit abstract. Uh, they're not just something you might, uh, you know, milk or kill to eat, right? They, they have this abstract value. You're going to need them in the future. Everybody's going to kind of need them because most people have kids and their kids get married. And so that is sort of where we find proto-money, right? And so... It does come out of this really deep set of social norms and, you know, marriage and murder really are these really fundamental human things that do seem tied up with money. And so I found that really interesting and and fun, frankly. (laughs) (laughs) It is fun because when you start thinking about it, it just it all suddenly makes sense. And I love that you go all the way back to 3500 B.C., I believe, And you share about this, kind of what we're talking about now, this IOU system that started as as kind of the base of money. And then we moved on to coins and so on. But I would love for you to tell, I I just love this story. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about Marco Polo and his, his crazy idea about paper money passing that really started what what I believe from the book, right? This idea of the paper part of money as as what we know it now. Yeah. So Marco Polo was a you know a Venetian traveler who went to China. Oh, I don't have the year in front of me, but somewhere I think in the twelve hundreds. And you know he's famous for coming back and telling his stories of China. And you know uh, he, he one of the one of the chapters in his book he comes back and he writes this book. And one of the chapters has a title again. I don't have it in front of me, but something like how the great Khan causeth the bark of trees to pass for money in his kingdom. And he, you know, he tells Europeans, the European readership, like, this is so ridiculous, you're not going to believe me. But in China, they use paper for money. Um, And, you know, they were using paper money at that time. The Chinese invented paper money uh, around 1000 uh, AD. Uh, Coins had been around for well over 1000 years by that point. But, you know, Paper itself didn't come along for a long time after coins were invented, and, and paper was invented in China. And and the, there was this moment a few hundred years before Marco Polo got to China in 
in Sichuan province in China, where they had been using iron coins. And iron, you know, this is back in the in the era when the the value of a coin was based on the value of the metal it was made of, right? So in Europe, they were using largely silver coins. Silver is right. pretty valuable. In most of China, they were using bronze coins. Bronze is somewhat valuable. But iron, like then as now, it was just not that valuable. So you needed a ton of iron coins to, to buy stuff. You needed a, a pound and a half, for example, a pound and a half of iron coins to buy a pound of salt, right? So it's just bad money. I, I like to think of it like if you got to use pennies when you go to the grocery store, right? It's just, it's not good. It's not good money. So some- <laughs> It's not efficient, yes. <laughs> it's so inefficient. And like, they didn't even have cars, right? Imagine having to like actually carry around all this iron. It's terrible. <laughs> right? So some merchant- in Sichuan has this idea where they say, okay, you give me your iron coins and I'll give you a receipt, like a, like a coin check, basically. And, uh, you know, that says, you know, I, uh, I owe you a thousand iron coins and I'll keep them in storage for you. And then those receipts start passing as money, right? Rather than go back to the merchant, get the thousand iron coins, go to the store, buy the thing. I just give the guy at the store my receipt that says like, this is good for a thousand iron coins. Just go get the coins you know, when you want them. And <laughs> that is that is the origin of paper money. And in fact, for the most part, not entirely, and we can talk about that, but for the most part, that idea that the paper is just a claim check for the metal is how money worked all the way up until the 20th century, right? The, the idea was the real valuable thing is was typically gold or silver, uh, or sometimes bronze, once in a while iron, uh, and the paper is just a claim check. That was that was the core idea of paper money. And it was a great idea, right? Like, even in the parts of China where they used uh, bronze coins, not as bad as iron, but not as light as paper, right? Uh, they realized that this paper money was a great idea. The government took over uh, printing paper money. And, you know, it made trade much easier. When you can carry a piece of paper instead of a wagon load of metal... That's a huge productivity gain. And in fact, it was this amazing period when China had this real economic flourishing that was, uh, you know, in part, I think, driven by the rise of paper money. Lots of other things. It was a sort of pro-trade kind of proto-science, lots of agricultural breakthroughs happening, like an exciting time. And then the Mongols came and conquered China. That was the Khan that Marco Polo saw was a, was a Mongol um, ruler. And they, you know, had this vast empire across Asia. They were nomadic. So they loved the idea of paper money. They got it. And, and in fact, Kublai Khan, who was the emperor when Marco Polo came, I believe he was the grandson of, of Genghis Khan. He, there was actually this moment when he said, you know what? We're not, you can't trade in your paper money for metal anymore. You, it's just, just use the paper. And sort of surprisingly, it actually worked, right? I mean, it worked partly because he could say, uh, use this paper money or I'll kill you because he was the con and that was the way they did it. So that's helpful. <laughs> but also, I think, right? you know, that, that would work. Yes. I mean, you know, OK, great. Con, I know I love paper. I'm super into paper money. Um, but also, you know, they'd been using uh, paper money for like hundreds of years by that point. So this is 200 years after paper money first begins. So people must have been quite used to it, right? 200 years is a really long time, generations and generations. Um, so it worked. That's what Marco Polo saw. Then there was a, a rebellion. The Mongols got pushed out. And kind of amazingly, well, there was a classic paper money problem. There was inflation, right? That's a thing we're familiar with at this moment. But much worse inflation was happening at various times uh, back then. And so this new dynasty that comes in in China, they actually get rid of paper money altogether. And this incredible innovation, really, it disappears from the world. Paper money just goes away. China stops using it. Europe hasn't adopted it yet. So it, you know, it creates this economic flourishing. It's great. There's inflation. People freak out about it. And they get rid of it. And it disappears for hundreds of years. I mean, it's just crazy. It, yes. It's, it's crazy yes. To, to hear the story, right? And, and to see the evolution. But I think one of the things that you're, that you're pointing to about paper money, which I, I, want, I do want to spend some time talking about, is this idea of, of trust, right? That we inherently trust that we can exchange this piece of paper to, to actually buy stuff. You know, and, and, you know, I'm thinking about 
sort of the evolution of that and how, you know, now we we have our money in in a bank. We don't actually see our money. We don't actually go into the vault in a bank and be like, oh, okay, here's here's my money. But we we have this this trust system. You know, why do you think it is that we we place so much trust in essentially, you know, money we can't see? Yeah, it is amazing. Like not only can't we see it, it it doesn't exist in any physical way, right? Like the bank does not have our money in the vault. You know, when we close our eyes and think of money, we think of paper bills. But uh, it's really just numbers on a ledger and not even on a paper ledger, right? It's it's numbers stored in the bank's computer. That's That's actually what money is. Not even fancy, you know, digital currency or whatever. Just the money in your checking account is not, there is nothing, there's no thing there, you know? It's just a ledger. I mean, why does it work? I think it works because it, in fact, works, right? It, if everybody decided not to take money, it wouldn't work. But, but it works remarkably well. Like, every time you want to buy stuff with money, you can. You can buy anything you want with money. Like, it's incredible. <laughs> it works amazingly well. I mean, I think it works because it has worked for so long. It works because the process of it becoming abstracted took a really long time, you know? It was uh, metal, and then it was paper that sort of stood for metal, and then it was paper that was just paper, and then it was, you know, your money in a checking account. And in fact, people have had money in checking accounts for a long time. I mean, we can point to specific historical things, right? Like in the Depression in the 1930s in the United States, the government for the first time guaranteed uh, normal people's money in the bank, right, up to a certain amount. Today, that limit is somewhere, I think it's $250,000. And before then, yes. your money in the bank was a loan to the bank. I mean, still in terms of accounting, your checking account is actually money you're loaning to the bank. We don't have to think of it that way because we don't have to worry about whether the bank is good for it. But it was the case before then that your money in the bank was not you know, you might not get it if the bank closed. The bank would say, sorry, we can't pay you back. You loaned us that money. And so part of why we think of money in the bank as money is because the government is good for it. I mean, there's the next level question. Why do we think of dollars as money? Why do we trust the government? I mean, again, because it basically works. People, lots of people say they don't trust the government or, you know, people are gold bugs or people are really into Bitcoin. But fundamentally, we're kind of forced to to exist in the dollarized economy. And frankly, even with inflation at 8%, which is bad, it's functional. It works. Financial anxiety, anyone? Yeah, you're not alone. But worrying about it, it doesn't help. Earnin does. Earnin is an app that gives you access to your pay as you work up to $100 per day or up to $750 per pay period. You just download the Earnin app and verify your paycheck. Then you can access up to $100 per day as you work and leave an additional tip. Any money you access plus tips are automatically repaid from your next paycheck. So how would you spend the money you get from Earnin? Well, honestly, my hubby and I have been feeling a little bit disconnected lately. That's what happens after you've been together about 12 years. So I would spend the money on a special date night with dinner and maybe bowling you know, to bring back some of that giggly excitement that we both felt at the beginning. Make Earnin a part of your financial routine and join Earnin's over three and a half million customers who say things like, when I think about Earnin, I think about financial stability, security, gives me a lot of peace of mind. Download Earnin today, spelled E-A-R-N-I-N, in the Google Play or Apple App Store. When you download the Earnin app, type in Talkin, T-A-L-K-A-N, money under podcast when you sign up. It will really help the show. Talkin money under podcast. Subject to your available earnings, location, daily max, and pay period max. See earnin.com slash T-O-S for details. Earnin is a financial technology company, not a bank. Bank products are issued by Evolve Bank & Trust, member FDIC. Millions of people have lost weight with personalized plans from Noom, like Evan, who can't stand salads and still lost 50 pounds. Salads generally for most people are the easy button, right? For me, that wasn't an option. I never really was a salad guy. That's just not who I am. But Noom worked for me. Get your personalized plan today at Noom.com. Real Noom user compensated to provide their story. 
In four weeks, the typical new user can expect to lose one to two pounds per week. Individual results may vary. Listen, if you've been using Mint to manage your money, I have got some news for you. First, the bad news. As you might know, Mint is shutting down for good. But the good news, well, there is a way better alternative that is a personal favorite of mine, Monarch Money. And I'm not the only lover of Monarch Money. Many Mint users are turning to Monarch Money and just raving about it. I used to manage my money with an Excel spreadsheet. I know, so archaic. And it was so time consuming. I tried all of the apps, but I just didn't find one I liked until I found Monarch. And I've got to tell you a secret. Monarch is so easy to use with a very intuitive design. You can even collaborate with your partner and you can customize Monarch for whatever your needs are. Monarch is the top rated all-in-one personal finance app. It gives you a comprehensive view of all your accounts, investments, transactions, and more. Create custom budgets, set goals, and collaborate with your partner. And now get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. Let's go back to the collaboration bit. Because we know money is a leading cause of divorce and breakups, Monarch has built-in collaboration features so you can invite your partner at no extra cost. You can see all your finances, make a budget together, get insights on your cash. Yes, cue the confetti. There will literally not be any more arguments over money. And if you've been frustrated with personal finance apps that are cluttered with ads, difficult to use, or rarely updated, so was Monarch. They built a new kind of personal finance app that's intuitive and powerful ad-free, and constantly improving based on customer feedback. Monarch has a tool that allows you as well to easily import your data from Mint. You can keep all of your tags and all of your categories. After trying Monarch for myself, I understand why it's the top-rated personal finance app. And right now, get an extended 30-day free trial when you go to monarchmoney.com etm. That's M-O-N-A-R-C-H-M-O-N-E-Y dot com slash etm for your extended 30-day free trial. Yeah, and I'm even thinking about, you know, this evolution of of the paper form of money and how I don't know about about you Jacob, but I can't remember the last time I actually pulled paper money out of my wallet to pay for something. You know, and how sort of that evolution of of money, it's just so interesting to me how you know, society has consistently evolved and I don't, it it makes me have this this is probably something we could ponder all day long, this curious question of Could society actually ever exist if there wasn't money? I mean, did we did we need money to evolve and grow? So I can think of two ways you could have a society without money. Uh, One is very small, right? Like fifty people or something who all know each other and have, you know, uh, essentially implicit or explicit rules about how to share, basically, right? Uh, That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is an economy that's basically like a totalitarian state, an authoritarian state, where there is some ruler who decides what everybody gets and what everybody does for work. Right. Um, And, you know, the Incas are kind of the signature version of that. The Incas were this great, big, complex society, and they didn't have money. They had rulers who sort of allocated all the resources. Um, I think that the beautiful thing money does is it lets you have a big, complicated society that is that is bottom up, that lets everybody make choices about what they want. I like that. That's really interesting. I mean, it's just interesting to kind of think about, you know, how society might exist without money. And it also makes me think about, like, where does it all go wrong? Do you see points in time where maybe we could have changed the system from this this one of blood and lust to something that maybe was a bit less divisive, we'll just say? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I can think of nerdy answers that are not in keeping with the great... I love the spirit of the question. I mean, I guess part of my answer to that question is, I actually think it works pretty well. I mean, you know, you can have different views about, say, um, the distribution, right? You can have different views about about fairness and the distribution of, of material goods in society. But you can change those things within the, the monetary, you know, regime that we have now. I think a lot of what makes people upset about money isn't actually money. It's about the stuff, you know, and money is just the, the the kind of the, 
the middleman, really, right? Like money is not wealth. Money is just the, the machinery by which we move wealth around. I don't know. It's, it's a really interesting kind of question to ponder. Um, and, and thinking about, you mentioned high inflation. And it's interesting that you mentioned that we had it at a point in time incredible inflation and they did away with paper money altogether. So it makes maybe our inflation now maybe not so scary. I don't know. But we're at this this moment of flex, right? We've got this global inflation and the great resignation happening. People really rethinking how they want to do life, maybe even rethinking the the meaning of money. So how do you think money evolves in the future? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, I've been covering and following cryptocurrency, to say a word that I feel like has to come into play somewhere in the answer to that question, cryptocurrency for... Uh, <laughs> More than 10 years now, actually. It was 2011. So obviously, I didn't buy any at that time, or else I wouldn't be sitting in a closet right? and recording a podcast now, although it's fun. You would fun. be on like... Yeah, I'd be in my blimp. I'd be living in a blimp. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, no, when I was doing the first Bitcoin story that I did, we were shocked at the, how much the price was going up. It had doubled from $10 to $20 per Bitcoin. <laughs> Um, so <laughs> true story, true story. It's, you can look it up. Um, and you know, at that time, Bitcoin was just this like clever way to buy things, right? It was very clever. And it had a lot of attributes of, you know, not quite anonymity, but sort of anonymity adjacent and native digital. And, you know, what I thought then, which was kind of what everybody thought was, Either this will work and people will use it to buy stuff, or it won't work and it'll go away. And the thing that's been really shocking to me is neither of those things happened, right? Like, it didn't work. People essentially don't use it to buy stuff in any meaningful way. And it didn't go away at all. People put, you know, billions of dollars into it and the price skyrocketed. And so, you know, in a lot of ways, I think at some point people kind of in the into this universe stopped calling it cryptocurrency and started calling it crypto i noticed um and yes. you know sure it's shorter yes but also i think people and especially people who are more involved in crypto stopped thinking of it primarily as money and you know uh some people talk about digital gold and gold really isn't money but more i, I feel like the more interesting conversation is you know sort of computing and and uh, automatic contracts and things like that, none of which I feel like anybody has really nailed yet. Clearly, there hasn't been like the killer app. But I feel like cryptocurrency has moved away from being money. And I don't really think it's going to be money. Uh, fundamentally, I mean, for a few reasons. One, I don't think it really solves any big problems with money. And kind of on the contrary, you've seen the crypto world sort of recreate classic problems in finance. You know, you've seen that more recently with projects blowing up. And the other reason is, you know, the way money works now is governments have a monopoly on money, right? In the US, the US government is the one making the dollars, basically the Fed. And governments aren't going to give that up. Like, it's nice to have a monopoly on printing money and governments are going to keep it that way. Uh, and, you know, it's been interesting to watch governments sort of allow for the development of crypto. But I think the development of crypto has been fundamentally not that threatening to governments. And so, you know, I think the basic monetary regime we're living in is going to persist, like not forever. Things change. But um, I think we'll still be using dollars for a long time, certainly. Well, that's probably a good thing for any of us that actually have dollars. Yeah. <laughs> I, like that I mean, the dollar bot, you know, the dollar is, uh, it's losing money in terms of inflation, but you can certainly buy more stuff in other countries. If you go on vacation to another country now, the dollar is more powerful than it's been in a long time. Yes, it's less painful. I remember going to Europe a few years ago and it was like, what? This is this is how much you know. You get home, you look at your credit card bill, and you're like, "Wait a minute!" Yeah, right. I didn't know like, I wait, spent that, that, that was that oh, was. Oh, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Oh, wait, right. Fifty euros is actually eighty bucks, but now fifty euros is fifty bucks. Right. Maybe maybe even less at this point. Yeah. Which is beautiful, and I think that's the beautiful story of money, right? Too. There is always 
a pro and a con. There is always maybe a good and a bad, or I don't. There's always this yin and yang about money uh, that's really, I think, makes it be this really interesting story. And I know we've talked about a few of these, but wondering if there are any maybe like aha moments while you were writing the book that really stunned even you about the evolution of money. I'm Samantha Cole, host of the new season of Understood, The Pornhub Empire. Over the course of four episodes, I'll tell you how a horny YouTube knockoff in Canada came to dominate the porn world, only to shatter their cheeky reputation in a massive scandal. The Pornhub Empire is a new season of Understood from the CBC. Available now wherever you get your podcasts. From Foreign Policy, I'm Rena Nainen, the host of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women. Over the past few years, we've looked at how women around the world are changing societal norms to increase their economic power. This season, we're focusing completely on girls, how they're pushing for a brighter, more powerful future, and what the rest of us can do to set them up for success. Join us for stories about girl power, young women who are fighting for change, to give themselves a chance to live a life of their own choosing. That's season six of The Hidden Economics of Remarkable Women, wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, I'm Karina Bemisterfer, host of Morning Cup of Murder, your daily true crime podcast. Yes, you heard me right, daily true crime. Every day, Morning Cup of Murder tells you a straightforward, short-form story about murder, true crime, cold cases, disappearances, serial killers, cults, and more. And I do that all in under 15 minutes. With over three years of stories and over 20 million downloads, the Morning Cup of Murder podcast has become a staple of so many people's daily routines. So why not add it to yours? Stream Morning Cup of Murder everywhere you listen to podcasts. And remember, stay safe. I'm just thinking, I mean, the China story was the one I didn't know at all before. I mean, there are, there are a bunch of things. There are a bunch of moments in money. I mean, there's one that is interesting to me and was surprising to me in part because I felt like I knew U.S. history pretty well. Like, I don't know much about Chinese history, so I wasn't that surprised that there was this amazing history of money in China. But there's this amazing moment in the United States in the, like, 1830s, 1840s, 1850s, when there were thousands of different kinds of money, thousands of different kinds of dollar bills and $2 bills and $5 bills, which I would have thought somebody would have told me that. You know what I mean? Like if I were a history teacher, I would tell every kid that because it's so wild and so fun to think about. And basically the way it worked was uh, private banks printed paper money. And uh, so and and at the time, the way banking worked in the U.S. was there were tons of little banks, little, you know, banks where there would be just one bank in a town, and that was the only bank. There weren't branches of a lot of banks. And so you had all of these different banks printing all different kinds of money, and some bankers would put their own face on the bill, and some of them, you know, if it was a fishing town, they'd put fish on the bill or whatever. There was a bank of St. Nicholas that put Santa Claus on the bill, which is less... It's so ridiculous to think about it, right? Just like think about how did that work and why did it happen? It's just it's just this amazing moment in the history of money and the history of the US that is so wild uh that I think everybody should know about it. It's so interesting. That is interesting. I I'm I can totally geek out on this stuff too. So <laughs> I think these stories are so interesting and they're they're part of our history and you're right. Everybody everybody should know about them. Uh, you are, you're the host of a new podcast. What's your problem? I want to hear more about that. But after writing this book, Money, were you like, okay, my days of talking about money are are over? Or is this a subject that is still really intriguing to you? No, it's still really intriguing to me. And, you know, there is, there is the sort of nerdier side of money with you know, the central banks and what is the Fed doing and what is the Bank of England doing and how does that relate to inflation? And I frankly love that. Like I follow that the way people follow sports or something, to be honest, not to be like crass or unfeeling about it. I understand that the stakes are higher, but it's just really interesting and kind of mysterious. I mean, one of the things that has become clear to me is nobody really understands inflation. 
You know, there's a kind of simple story that the that the Fed tells, that central banks tell. And it's not wrong, you know, when their interest rates are lower, that tends to drive up inflation and stimulate the economy. Like, that's basically true. But but the details of how it works and how the timing works and what happens when are totally a mystery. And so if you go back to before the pandemic, it was surprising to, I think, most experts how low inflation stayed for how long. And now you have inflation going back up and nobody knows what it's going to take to get it back down. And so it's, it is sort of endlessly fascinating to me and mysterious. I think mysterious to everybody to an extent that is underappreciated. Like if you don't get it, it doesn't mean that it's because you're not an expert. The experts at some level don't get it either. That is definitely like a, you know, a bumper sticker, uh, a quote for sure. Because I think to some extent, you're right. We're all out here just kind of bumping around, trying to understand, trying to understand money, trying to understand how all of this works. And, you know, with everything that you've learned about money, tell us about your, your new podcast, What's Your Problem, and kind of what you're, what you're tackling now. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for asking about that. So the show is called What's Your Problem? And it actually comes out of comes out of something I wrote in the book that's sort of sort of a tangent in the book. But, you know, one of the ideas, I, I think really the big idea in economics is that the way humanity as a whole gets better off over time is by coming up with better, more efficient ways to do things, right? Like we, in general, most people are much richer than, say, their great-grandparents were. Around the world, that is like wildly the case. And so I got interested in the kind of more nuts and bolts question of how do people figure out better ways to do things, right? I mean, the, the kind of frontier of that today is, is technology, right? That's really what we mean when we talk about technology. So this show, What's Your Problem, is just me interviewing people who are, you know, typically running or they're engineers at companies that are kind of out on the frontier trying to figure out better ways to do things, whether it's, you know, self-driving cars or uh, bringing uh, analytics to the NBA or, you know, trying to figure out, I don't know, the guy this week started an online quilt company with his family, right? But he's very clever about how to have a quilt company with his family. So, so that's what the show is. It's interviewing people, you know, building companies, trying to figure out better ways to do things kind of out there on the technological frontier. I love that. I love intentionality and thinking about money in these terms. And I love, you know, kind of rolling up our sleeves and diving in and talking about money. What do, what do we hear listening right now? What do we need to remember about like the place, the power, the purpose that money has in our lives going forward? One thing that's interesting to me is I think of myself in general as a pretty rational person. And I am not very rational about money in a lot of ways. Um, like, I'm, I'm fine. I don't do dumb things with money. You know, I do all the things. I pay off my credit cards and I have low-cost index funds. I know all the things to do and I do those things. I don't mean that. I mean on like an emotional level, there are like things that are a relatively small amount of money, things that I can afford, things that shouldn't be a big deal in my life that I'll have a very strong emotional reaction to, whether it's spending hours are driving across town to try and save 10 bucks. Not rational, right? My time is worth more than that. Or whether it's getting irrationally upset if I'm charged an extra 10 bucks on something. No big deal. I've got 10 bucks. Like how, how strong of an emotional response I still have to relatively small amounts of money when really I should know better is really interesting to me. And, and I do find it useful to be aware of that, right? You asked that in a sort of, what do I think people should know? I think just reflecting on the fact that money is very emotional beyond, beyond what it should be. Like, clearly, we need money to live, and clearly having more money can be useful. And so it's reasonable to be emotionally invested in it at a kind of macro level. But I feel like our emotional investment at a dollar-to-dollar -dollar level is often disproportionate, certainly in my case. And, and just being aware of that is helpful. I mean, it's no wonder that we're all like tangled up in money. The story is literally one of blood and lust, like Jacob talked about. And we see that echoed in everyday life right now. I think really the understanding of the history of money, though, it can help you put into perspective your present relationship with money. It is not just you that has stumbled to make sense of money or fallen prey to its powers. 
So if you haven't read Jacob's book, Money, do yourself a favor, grab it wherever books are sold. You can also check out his new podcast, What's Your Problem, on any podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, you loved hearing about the history of money, share it right now with friends, family members, anyone who you know would love to hear this information as well. You can head to the show notes for all the links to our episode guest, as well as our episode sponsors. And I'll see you back here in a few days for a brand new episode. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 4.5% APY on an 8-month CD special or 4.25% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash CD specials. Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC.